Hello everyone, wherever in the world you may be listening to me. Welcome to another session in which we're looking at some of the introductory or foundational principles to sports and exercise psychology. Today we're looking at the issue of arousal, stress and anxiety. Now these are, these are three terms that are often used interchangeably, but there are subtle differences between the terms. And we do want to spend some time and understand those differences and understand their implications for athletic performance. Now, I thought I would start with this, folk, this particular quote. Now, this quote is from Bill Shankly. Bill Shankly is a former manager of Liverpool Football Club. Liverpool plays in the top division of the English Football League, known as the Premier Division. Most of you have probably heard about Liverpool Football Club, and they have a rich and successful history. And one of the managers that was uh, most influential and shaped that success was Bill Shankly. Now, he makes this statement. He says, some people think football is a matter of life and death. I assure you, it's much more serious than that. And he was probably making that statement uh, tongue in cheek. He was probably being a bit facetious, uh, but he was pointing to something that athletics and competitive sporting endeavors can create great drama and also provoke great stress and anxiety for those participating in the sport and for those even watching the sport and in and around the sport. Sometimes this can have uh, terrible consequences with riots and fighting. And so in thinking about arousal, stress, and anxiety, we're thinking about a core issue inside of the realm of sport that needs to be understood and needs to be managed. So let's start with arousal. Now, arousal can be defined as a blend of physiological and psychological activity in the person. And you'll see as we look at arousal, anxiety, and stress, that all three have a physiological and a cognitive component, a physiological and a psychological component. Physiological or somatic refer to tangible, visible changes in the body, whereas cognitive or psychological refers to changes in attention and perception and how you're interacting with what's going on around you. So arousal refers to the level of a motivation, alertness, and excitement at any particular moment. Arousal exists on a continuum, and it's said to be non-directional. So you can see inside of the image on your screen that several words can be used to describe high arousal, like alert or nervous, elated. Uh, in the same way, uh, several words can be used to describe low arousal, like content, serene, and relaxed. But you can also see on the diagram, the image, that arousal can sometimes be positive or it can be negative. So someone could be highly aroused and uh, they're elated and excited. On the opposite end, the negative side of high arousal would be nervousness and stress. Same, similarly, for low arousal, uh, the negative side would be depressed or lethargic, whereas the positive side would be serene and content. So in thinking about arousal, there are many different things to be thinking about, and that's why it's such an important component in affecting performance. So you can see uh, that uh, there's a continuum, a continuum of arousal. Uh, at the lower end here, you can see the lowest end of arousal is to be uh, asleep, uh, all the way to the highest end, which is actually called flooding, where there's just uh, you're just too aroused, you're over aroused. Now, within the context of sport, um, in order to react, in order to think and make decisions, in order to execute uh, the necessary uh, sequence and skills to do well, uh, there needs to be a certain level of arousal. And one of the things that we're interested in as an athlete or as a coach or as a performance psychologist is what level of arousal is optimal uh, for that particular skill or that particular sport. And then also, how can you stay within that zone of arousal 
uh, that flow, uh, that place of optimal arousal and not get shifted and therefore ensure you uh, perform at your best. So these are some of the questions that we'll be thinking about and trying to answer as we look into this issue of arousal. So we're going to go through several theories of arousal. And the first one is drive theory. Now, all of these theories seek to predict or model how athletic performance is going to change with the level of arousal. So you can see on the graph on the y-axis is the quality of the performance. And you can see on the x-axis is the level of arousal. And drive theory posits a linear relationship between the level of arousal and the quality of performance. In other words, drive theory says, the more aroused you are, the more alert you are, the better your level of performance. And this continues even when you reach high levels of arousal. Now this was the earliest theory of arousal. And to some extent, it makes sense uh, because we know if someone is uh, depressed or someone is sleepy or someone has very low levels of arousal, they probably won't perform well. But as you increase their levels of arousal, you do see uh, improved performance. But we also know that in highly uh, competitive situations, situations of high intensity where there will be high levels of arousal, Think about a, a World Cup final uh, in football, uh, and you have seen people miss penalties or miss open goals in the midst of those high pressure moments. So there are situations where high levels of arousal actually lead to a diminishing of performance. And sometimes that's even referred to as choking. So this idea of drive theory is built upon a, a simple equation. And this says the performance is going, to, is going to be affected by your habit strength versus your level of arousal or versus your drive. Now, habit strength is how well you have learned a task. Uh, how easily does that task come to you? Is it something that's ingrained and you've trained your muscles? And as we say, you have muscle memory for that task. And so that is an easy task for you. And this is often referred to as the dominant task. And what we find is drive theory actually works quite well with simple skills or people who are highly skilled like experts, as you can see with the orange diagram or the orange line in the graph you find that persons who are very skilled, uh, and when the skills are simple, uh, that the more they are aroused, the better they're able to perform. But if you actually have a difficult task or a task that you're learning for the first time, actually high levels of arousal don't help. So you think about any particular skill you are trying to learn for the first time. And you would have realized that if you're too aroused, or too hyped up, too anxious, it's very difficult to master that skill. Uh, you needed to slow down and calm yourself down and focus on what the different components of that skill in order to do well. One of the other things that therefore happens with drive theory is as arousal increases, performers then begin to uh, display their dominant skill. Now this is great if you're an expert, and if you've learned that skill well. But if you're a novice or an intermediate athlete and you haven't learned that skill well, as that dominant skill comes to the fore, the dominant skill comes with all of its mistakes and therefore you won't perform well. So this highlights uh, the importance of practice and refining your technique and learning these dominant skills. Because the more aroused you become, the more you move towards these dominant skills. Uh, and you want to ensure that those dominant skills can stand up under those high levels of arousal. So drive theory does have some applications, but in summary, we can say that it's not always the best because as arousal increases, there is a tendency, especially for more complex tasks, for performance to drop off. 
So this has led to another theory of arousal known as the inverted U theory. Now the inverted U theory like drive theory says that as arousal increases, performance will increase. But as you see in the graph, what it highlights is there's an optimal level of arousal. And if you go beyond that optimal level, what's going to happen is you're going to realize that performance is now going to drop. And that's why the graph is like an upside down U, hence the term, the inverted U theory. Any increase of arousal beyond the optimal state is going to lead to a decrease in performance. And so this goes back to what we were saying a little while ago. The fact that athletes and coaches and the team wants to find what's that optimal level and how can we stay there? Uh, and that works very well with this inverted U theory. So at low levels of arousal, performance isn't so great. At high levels of arousal, performance isn't so great. But somewhere in between, you get an ideal uh, balance and you get optimal performance. Now we know that um, arousal can be affected by several things. Uh, all of us are different. And I just also told you that the nature of the task, is it simple or difficult, uh, can have an influence on how arousal affects performance. And therefore, in thinking about the level of arousal and how it relates to performance, one thing that doesn't come across in the inverted U hypothesis is the fact that maximum performance might not always occur at the midpoint. So if you look at that graph that I just showed you previously, let's just go back. You can see this graph suggests that maximum performance, best performance occurs at a midpoint for arousal. But what we're saying is for some individuals, that not be, might not be the case. Uh, they might uh, actually perform better at a lower level of arousal, whereas for others, it might be higher. And also, maybe certain tasks vary uh, in what level of arousal is best. What this has done is it's given rise to another theory of arousal, which is called the individualized zones of optimal functioning. And as you can see in this diagram, we have three athletes, A, B, and C, on the x-axis. Uh, an athlete A they perform best when their arousal is fairly low. Athlete C, he or she performs best when their arousal is fairly high. Whereas athlete B is more in the traditional mode. Uh, they perform best when their arousal is in that middle zone, that moderate zone. And this is what uh, is pe perhaps most uh, uh, common uh, inside of actual sport and athletic endeavor. Uh, the majority of people probably uh, perform best somewhere in the middle, but there are distinct subsets of people. And you can see them in certain athletes who look very calm, uh, who look very low key. Um, one athlete that kind of comes to mind as I think about this is a Kawhi Leonard in NBA basketball, or some of you may remember a Carl Hooper from test cricket. Uh, they seem to be a little bit more low key and seem to have high, uh, lower levels of arousal but still performed very, very well. Whereas some athletes, uh, they need to be very amped up, uh, thinking about like a, a Dennis Rodman in NBA basketball, or maybe a John McEnroe in tennis. Uh, the more angry he got, the better he seemed to perform. Uh, uh, athletes who high levels of arousal lead to high levels of performance. And hence we talk about these individual zones of optimal functioning. Uh, each athlete has their own zone where they hit a flow and they get that maximum output. Now, one last theory of arousal that we want to just talk about, building on from the inverted U, is something called the catastrophe model, the catastrophe model. Now, the inverted U model suggests that as you pass optimal, there's a slow decrease in performance. But actually, what you observe in real life is often when you tr cross over into too high levels of arousal, uh, performance actually drops, and it drops very suddenly. Uh, so it doesn't slowly come down in a very predictable manner. There's a sudden drop, 
as high levels of physiological and cognitive arousal take over. And that level of drop, that uh, sudden loss of performance, uh, that's where we call the catastrophe. Things just fall apart. And again, that is something that has been observed very, very often in sporting situations. Often it's referred to as choking, uh, where something has happened in a, a situation of extreme pressure. Uh, and the result of that is uh, the performance drops way below what was expected. That's led to this whole idea of clutch. Uh, the performers who are best able to uh, do well under pressure. Uh, you can see an image of Michael Jordan there, uh, and he was considered clutch. Uh, and then you can see a meme that's making a bit of fun about LeBron James and saying he's not clutch. The interesting thing about clutch is the statistics often don't line up with what's portrayed in the media. So if you actually look at the statistics, uh, from a statistical point of view, some might argue that LeBron is more clutch than Michael Jordan. Uh, but Michael Jordan has this narrative around him of always being clutch. I'm raising these things because these are some of the things that also can create anxiety and stress for an athlete. Because there is an expectation that athletes have to perform in the moments of highest pressure. But yet this is also the place where you can have this catastrophe theory coming in to play. So we've looked at um, the different theories of arousal and how they influence performance. We just want to talk about, uh, so what happens uh, to athletes as that arousal increases? Well, as arousal increases, we're going to see in a little while, we're moving towards stress and anxiety. And that can increase the level of tension within muscles. It can increase your levels of fatigue. And ultimately, that's going to lead to issues with coordination. The other thing that arousal does is it affects cognitive performance. So it's going to affect things like your attention, your concentration, and your visual searching. Now, attention is that ability of you to focus on what is required for the task at hand. At the optimal level of arousal, you focus on the relevant things. However, as you become increasingly aroused, what can tend to happen is you can narrow your level of attention and you only focus upon something that you think is hyper important. Uh, and that denies you of information from other sources. Uh, and that can lead to decreased um, performance. That denying of information is because there's decreased environmental scanning. And then you shift to your dominant style, as I spoke about before. And if your dominant style is not highly refined, uh, you can have a problem. And then other things like uh, wrong thoughts come into your mind, performance worries and irrelevant thoughts, and you don't process information correctly. And all of these things can lead to a decrease in performance. And you will realize then that regulating arousal is a very, very important component of the mental process of an athlete. And it's something that we'll look at in another session. So what about um, uh, the opposite of, uh, uh, well, let, let's put it like this. In thinking about arousal, uh, we want to be very careful how we manage arousal uh, because you need to help your athlete discover the, the ideal level of arousal. And in thinking about arousal, as we've just seen in terms of catastrophe theory, if you push the person to become too aroused, the result is they can go into the game uh, too hyped up. And those initial moments, if they're too hyped up, they might not perform well. And the end result is they could fall behind in the game. And now they're in a, in a, a battle where they're trying to come back. Uh, they're very aroused. They might try to uh, get even more aroused to come back, and then things actually begin to fall apart. And so there's this general sense that before a match, you have to hit this high moment of arousal. 
but sometimes that can push you over into the catastrophe, uh, catastrophe mode. Uh, and so you have to be very careful when you're looking at uh, how you manage arousal. An athlete should have a, a good uh, understanding of what works for them and how it applies to their situation. Okay, so let's talk a little bit now about stress. Uh, I guess we can think of stress as maybe uh, too much arousal, but that's not the best way to think about it. Stress refers to the bodily and cognitive responses to an environmental demand. So stress is a term that's ubiquitous. Uh, it's used in everyday life, but from a biological view, uh, it refers to the fact that all the time we're going to encounter demands uh, in, this, in the circumstances around you, environmental demands. And your body has to respond to those demands. And so stress is a term that describes how your body responds to those demands. Now, often stress is associated with the term fight or flight. Normally, people are in a place of physiological balance, which is called homeostasis. But when that environmental demand comes upon you, you now have to respond to it. And traditionally, it's been said that you respond to it by engaging with it, which will be termed fight, or removing yourself from it, which will be termed flight. Uh, some people add a third F in this model called freeze. Now to engage with the, the, the stressor or to remove yourself from the stressor, you require energy. Uh, and so what happens is your body then shifts how it's functioning and it begins to produce energy and it shifts your body away from non-essential things that aren't required to meet the demands of the stressor. So for example, at this point, you don't need your digestive system. At this point, you don't need your reproductive system. So blood flow to these systems is reduced, but you, need, you do need to be very alert. You do need the right hormones flowing through your body. You do need your uh, heart pumping blood and oxygen getting through your muscles. So all of these systems begin to activate. And these are the physiological changes that take place to prepare you for fight or flight. And of course, with those physiological changes, there are also cognitive changes uh, as your, your nervous system becomes more alert and your attention begins to focus in and zero in on the environmental demand. Now this fight or flight uh, mechanism has a fast response and a slow response. Imagine you're, you're in a room uh, and, and a tiger or a lion walks in. I guess that's very unusual. Or imagine you're, you're in a room at home and you suddenly feel like there's an intruder somewhere in the house. Immediately your heart rate begins to go up. Immediately you go on high alert. And that's due to the activity of your sympathetic nervous system. But at the same time, your body also mounts an endocrine response via the pituitary gland and the adrenal cortex to release other stress hormones. And these two components of physiological responses lead to increased heart rate, increased respiratory rate, mobilization of glucose for energy, blood flowing uh, towards your muscles, a heightened levels of, nurture, of alertness and, and focusing on particular things. So think about it. Uh, you just perceive there may be an intruder in your home. Uh, and what do you do? Your, your attention goes towards particular sounds in a particular direction. You focus in on something. Uh, that's what we talk about, cognitive changes that are taking place. Now, generally, when we think about stress, we tend to view it in a very negative light. In fact, the term stress is often considered negative. But as you've just seen from a biological point of view, uh, stress actually just re represents your body preparing to meet a demand. And one of the early researchers on stress, a gentleman called Hans Seyle, S-E-Y-L-E, -E, uh, he proposed a continuum of stress, a continuum of stress. Uh, the way he said it was that when you meet an environmental demand, 
your body responds and prepares you to meet that demand. And he described that as you stress because your body is now getting itself ready to meet that demand. And that process of getting itself ready to meet the demand is actually a good thing. Uh, let me repeat that, it's actually a good thing. Uh, as you've seen, if you have to deal with the lion or deal with the tiger, or do well in your athletic endeavor, or do well on an examination, that lower level of stress actually uh, causes you to do well. It increases your blood flow and prepares your body in the correct way. And so you can call that positive stress or you stress. However, two things could happen. If you feel the demand that's coming to you is beyond your ability to cope, you don't have the capacity to cope with it, then your stress levels increase. Or if that stressor stays there for a long time and you cannot remove yourself from the stressor or overcome the stressor, that also is going to cause a burnout. And so sometimes this use stress is called the resistance phase. But if you stay in that state for too long, and that stressor stays around for too long, it can push you over to another stage called distress. And that's where you tend to have a problem. Uh, that's where you can get burnt out and have disorganized behavior and make bad decisions. And so in terms of sport, one of the key things is, do you feel you have the capacity to meet the stressor? And if you do that, I can activate a positive stress response known as you stress. Or do you feel that it's overwhelming you and that can then lead to a negative response? So we can then say that the stress process is highly influenced by the cognitive appraisal of the athlete. If we look at it in terms of stages, we can see the first stage, stage one, is the arrival of an environmental demand, either physical or psychological. Stage two, though, is very key. It's how does the individual perceive that demand? Do they perceive it as a threat or do they perceive it as something that they can engage with? Based upon that, you will then have the stress response, the physiological and the psychological changes, the increased heart rate, the increased respiratory rate, the activation of the muscles and so on, the attentional changes. And then you're going to have, because of those physiological changes, the behavioral consequences. Uh, if they're done correctly, uh, you perform better. But if it's too much, uh, there's catastrophe and you don't perform as well. And so within the context of sports and exercise psychology, uh, this idea of cognitive appraisal in stage two is very, very important and it's key within that stress-anxiety continuum. Now, this whole idea of the fact that how an individual uh, perceives stress is very important. Because if you perceive stress as being too great for you, as negative, that's probably going to lead to lower performance. And what we've discovered is that persons who perceive stress as something that's positive, something that they can control, that actually leads to higher performance and therefore it's called facilitative, facilitative stress. And this is often referred to as a reversal theory because when the athlete uh, feels that physiology of their heart rate increasing, when they feel their body getting a little tense, uh, they say, ah, it's time for action. Now I'm ready to perform. And so therefore they don't see stress and anxiety as negative, they reverse it and they see it as facilitative. As opposed to other people who when they see their, feel their muscles begin to tense up or their hearts begin to increase, uh, they get overwhelmed by it uh, and they see it as a negative experience and then it becomes debilitative. And so we want to recognize that that individual cognitive appraisal is absolutely critical uh, to managing the stress response and determining what direction you will go in. And this is a really great example. Uh, I think many of us know of Steph Curry. 
uh, one of the top basketballers in the NBA. Uh, and he made this statement. He said, I've never been afraid of big moments. I get butterflies. I get nervous and anxious. Now, he's describing the fact that when situations get heightened, he experiences some level of physiological stress. He's describing butterflies in his stomach. He's describing a sense of anxiety. But then listen to what he says. But I think those are all good signs that I'm ready for the moment. Very, very important. So when the signs of stress arrive, he views them as facilitated. His cognitive appraisal, he's trained himself to say, I can meet this moment. And his cognitive appraisal says, yes, I'm going to do well now. And so he's able to manage the stress response. There's another famous athlete, uh, Billie Jean King. She's a famous uh, woman's uh, tennis player from the 1970s. Uh, and she made this statement that it's uh, written on the walls of the US Open. Uh, she says, pressure is a privilege. Again, a facilitative view of stress. When you begin to feel pressure, don't view it as a negative. Recognize the fact that you, the fact that you are feeling that pressure, that's a privilege because most people don't get to experience that. There are thousands and thousands of people who would love to be in the situation you find yourself in right now, in the final of that US Open and feeling the, the pressure of the moment to perform. Uh, and so she described it as pressure is a privilege. Okay. We just looked at facilitative and debilitative stress. And if you encounter a situation where now it seems overwhelming and you've shifted over into debilitative stress, this is where we now can say anxiety steps in. Anxiety occurs when there's too much stress. It's a negative emotional state that's associated with nervousness and apprehension, but it also has a somatic component. So you worry about things, you're concerned about things, you're overly thinking things through, but you also get those physiological changes that I just started to talk about that can become all consuming. And if they're too much, we now say you're in a state of anxiety. Well, what are the symptoms of anxiety or that distress, that too much stress? You could have cold, clammy hands, cold sweating. Uh, you might feel the need to urinate, go to the bathroom. Uh, you might start to have negative self-talk, criticize yourself. Your eyes become dazed and glazed over. Uh, you might actually feel nauseous and ill, get a headache. Um, if it's going on for a long time, like before a, a competition, uh, you might have difficulty sleeping. Uh, you have increased muscle tension and butterflies in the stomach, and you might have inability to concentrate. And you can understand if all of these things are going on with you, it's going to make it very difficult to perform at your best. So these are just some of the symptoms of anxiety and stress. And if you've been someone who's ever performed in sport, I'm sure you've experienced these before. Now, in thinking about anxiety, we describe two types of anxiety or two dimensions. One is called state anxiety. And that's the anxiety that's induced by a particular situation. Just like we spoke about, uh, it's a World Cup final and you have to take a penalty. Uh, a billion people are watching on television all across the earth. Uh, and you're aware of that. And so you have these feelings of apprehension. You have all of these somatic uh, uh, um, changes that we just described. It's that right now feeling of nervousness. But you know that if you score the penalty, that's going to go away in a moment. Uh, it's going to be replaced by euphoria and relief. And so you know that that's not your constant state. Uh, that's just temporary. And it's remote related very, very much to the situation. And you also know that you have a sense that you can control it. So state anxiety refers to anxiety in the moment due to the particular situation. Now, trait anxiety, and you will realize, comes from personality theory. And it says that there are some people who are more disposed to being anxious. And so it's a stable tendency to attend to, experience, 
and report negative emotions such as fears, worry, and anxiety in many situations that you might not expect it. And it can become clinically a problem and you do have people with what is described as anxiety disorders. So people with high trait anxiety are given to high levels of anxiety in many situations and can respond disproportionately depending on the circumstances. So a person with high trait anxiety is expected then to have a higher level state anxiety depending upon the situation. And so you can see here then is, as often seen in sports psychology, the interaction between the personal and the situational factors. In thinking about stress and anxiety, you have to think about what are the personal factors within the person, particularly what's their level of trait anxiety and self-esteem. And then you have to think about what's the situational factors. Is the competition important? Is there a high level of success or low level of success? And those things are going to interact to then determine the level of arousal and state anxiety. And as we just said, someone who comes in with high trait anxiety is much more likely to go to high state anxiety uh, in many uh, situations as, composed to some, as compared to someone who has low trait anxiety. And so this diagram here just summarizes uh, a lot of the things that we've spoken about. Uh, it talks about trait anxiety and state anxiety. This being trait, uh, a natural disposition to be anxious and state the moment to moment changes. It highlights the fact that arousal can lead to state anxiety if you become too aroused. And then it goes on to show that if you have anxiety in a moment, you are going to get cognitive changes and somatic changes. And key to this entire process is going to be your level of perceived control, how you view that situation, how you view that arousal, and can you manage that anxiety and mobilize your body's resources, mental and physical, towards the task at hand. The final thing I'll just mention is arousal and anxiety are, are, are crucial aspects of sports and exercise psychology. And therefore, understanding what's happening in an individual and in groups is very important. And so there are great attempts to measure the level of arousal and anxiety. We can do this directly using physiological means. Uh, we can actually record heart rate, respiratory rate, sweating, and a measure of skin conductors or changes in different metabolites inside of the blood. Uh, of course, those kinds of things are much more suited for laboratory situations. Uh, very difficult to do those in actual sporting competitions, though it can happen, especially with all of these trackers that are now being used uh, on your watch uh, that you can wear. The other, uh, of course, way of measuring some of these things are, are psychological scales, which are often self-report scales or scales that a coach can use to evaluate um, their athletes. And there are many different scales and we'll look at those in other sessions. Just want to make you aware that it's important that if you delve into this more, uh, that we use these tools to understand our athletes and understand how they're performing in sport. Okay, so that brings us to an end of this session on arousal, stress, and anxiety. Uh, in it, we've seen that arousal is a key component to allowing athletes to do well and to perform well. However, we've seen by looking at the different theories of arousal that athletes must learn to regulate their arousal levels to get into that optimal zone, that optimal zone or that optimal flow state. If not, then the stress response becomes too great and it can trigger and lead to a crossing over into anxiety. Uh, and that can lead to very deleterious effects upon performance. I think one of the best ways for you to think about this is to just become even more conscious of your own responses if you are engaged in athletic endeavor or look more carefully at what's taking place when you see how athletes perform on television and on, in competitions. So until next time, I hope this session has made you more aware and will make you more conscious as you look around at 
athletes performing up? What are the many things going on through their minds and affecting their performance? Take care.